If you are a person of color, a black man living in America, then you already know that you have been lied to about a lot of things. What you probably don't know is that you have been sorely lied to about almost everything. Everything that you hear and that you read about yourself, about your history, you need to question because it is probably not true. Why? Well, location, location, location. It's one of the oldest tricks in the book. If they can lie to us about where we come from, then we will not know where we are supposed to go. We will not know what we are supposed to do. What we are taught in school is that all the black men and women in the Americas were brought over here by the Europeans. That is one of the biggest lies that is out there today. And they use that lie in order to hide the fact that most of us were here before them and that most of the people of color here in the Americas can trace their ancestors to their land, to the Americas, in some cases up to 1600 or over 2000 years before the Europeans came here. But why were we lied to? Again, it's about the location. If you don't know that you are from this land, then you will not be as willing to fight for it. You will not be as willing to die and to shed blood for it. If anything, I'm sure they have told us before, you should go back to Africa because that is where you come from. Well, the Europeans have lied to us here in the Americas um, over and over and over again. But it, it is not something new because if you follow the Bible, you know that um, a lot of the nations of Europe are simply children of the Chaldeans, children of the Babylonians, children of the Canaanites that, were, that was on the land that Israel went to. And so the same things that they used to do back then is the same things that they are doing today. I'm not talking about the regular person of Europe. I'm talking about the elite. I'm talking about the bankers, the multinational corporations, the bloodlines that run and govern Europe and by extension, much of the rest of the world. Well, this trick that they're using that has to do with location, it's something that they've been using for generations. In fact, for a very long time. Even before Europe came to power, the same trick was being used by the Assyrians. When Israel fell about 720 BC, the populations of Israel was deported. Most of the cities, their populations were taken to a land outside of Israel, to a land in the Assyrian Empire. They would be relocated. And what the Assyrians did is that they brought people from other cities in other parts of the Assyrian Empire and they brought those people into Israel, into the cities of Israel. And so in that way, the people that they brought into Israel would not be tied to the land. They would not be willing to fight as hard for the land. They would know that they come from someplace else. If anything, they would seek to return. If anything, they would not want to shed as much blood to stay on that land because they know they don't really belong there. In the same way, the Assyrians hope that the populations of the children of Israel, that they relocated to another part of, that, of the empire, those populations would not be willing to die and to shed blood knowing that it is not their land that they are fighting for. Um, the same thing happened to the, the uh, southern kingdom of Judah. About 120 years later, the Babylonians with Nebuchadnezzar came and they destroyed 
Judah. And they took those populations and they relocated them as well. And they, just like the Assyrians before them and other empires before the Assyrians, they transplanted other populations into Judah. That way the, the new populations that are in the southern kingdom would not be as willing to fight um, to overthrow the Babylonians. They also encouraged the children of Edom at that time to go into Israel. And that's why we find there's a lot of corruption today in the way we have come to accept things because a lot of those people, a lot of the children of Edom that went into Jerusalem had an effect in the way we see um, the, say, the name um, of our father today. They're the ones who eventually made it uh, almost illegal to say the name of our father. Um, now, why did the Babylonians do this? Again, they wanted a population in place that would not present as many problems. A population in place that would be more submissive and more obedient because they are not tied to the land. The same trick is being used by the uh, children of the Babylonians today, by the Neo-Babylonians, um, by the European empires. The same trick is used today. All over Africa, everybody's history has been rewritten because of European domination. Likewise, in the America, our history has been rewritten. We are told that we do not have any ties to the land. We are told that all of us came from Africa, but that is a lie. At least they are not the ones to have brought us over. We came in some cases 1600 years or more, up to 2100 years before Columbus. Um, we came and settled the Americas. And so when the Europeans came all over North and South America, they found people of all, all color, but primarily they found people of color. And they found a lot of black men and they found a lot of brown men, um, men who today they want to call Native Americans. Um, but what they have done is they have cleverly um, stereotyped one particular look that the Native Americans have to say that if you don't look this way, you are not a Native American. Again, that's a lie. And the reason that we are taught that in our schools, generation after generation after generation, is so that we will not feel any ties to the land, so that we will not know that we were born in America for, for generations and generations and generations before the Europeans came. Um, that way we will not be willing to fight for the land. We will not be willing to call unto our king, the king of Israel, to deliver the land to us. We will not be willing to ask our father um, for help in taking back our land. If anything, we should go back to Africa. Well, we know that there was a slave trade. We know that um, a lot of Africans were brought over by the Europeans into the Americas. But the truth is the vast, vast majority of us, most of our bloodline was here before the Europeans came. Our history was rewritten. All of the early slaves were Native Americans. They were people my complexion, people darker, people lighter, and they were enslaved by Europe. And only after Europe took a population that was most likely over 2 billion, 2 billion people in North and South America combined, after they had reduced and decimated that population completely, reduced it by over 95%, only then did they begin to bring in our brothers 
and our sisters who are living along the coast of Africa into the Americas. That's why there's a verse in the Bible that says, though our people be replenished from the east, replenished from the east is along the, uh, the western coast of Africa, across the Atlantic, replenishing the children of Israel that were already here in the Americas. <clears throat> now, um, how did we get here? Well, Israel was destroyed 720 years before Christ. King Solomon was here a good 250 years before that. He was in ancient Israel and he most likely visited the New World, visited the Americas himself. But we know for certain that he used to send um, expeditions that lasted three years, expeditions by ship. He used to pack up a few ships with men and goods and they would go around um, South Africa. That means that they would leave out of a port in Judah. And that port, um, I believe, is called, what is it? Um, Ezion Jeber. You can check the, 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 the proper name out. But Solomon sent expeditions out. And those expeditions took three years for their trip to uh to be completed why that's because those ships left out of a port called Ezion jeber um in the red sea and it would go down the eastern coast of africa around south africa and into the americas brazil and then the islands and then from there it would sail northward through the straits of Gib uh, of gibraltar into the Mediterranean Sea and back into Israel. That trip we learned took three years. That's where he went to a land called Ophir for gold. That gold is in the Americas. Solomon was coming to the Americas even 1000 years before Christ. And he was not the first. The ancient Canaanites, the Phoenicians, also came to the Americas and um, the Egyptians as well. They left pyramids all across the Americas and, um, and their mark here is well known. They came even before Solomon and then when Israel was destroyed, those that could, those among Israel that knew that the slow marching armies of the Assyrians were coming, they got on ships and they left um, knowing that they can make it to a land um, that would be far away from the Assyrians. And when Nebuchadnezzar came um, to destroy Judah, the children of Judah also remembered that uh, King Solomon um, used to go to a faraway land. And they too, those that could, got on ships heading for that land. And whenever they got on ships to go to a distant land, they very often would make stops along the, uh, the coastline. And as they would make stops, sometimes they would leave people behind. They would leave colonies behind. And these colonies um, would grow. 10 became 100, 100 became 1,000, 1,000 into millions and into nations. And so you have nations of the children of Israel that is along all the coastlines probably of the world certainly of asia the coastlines of africa and into the americas and that's why prophecy was able to be fulfilled because our father said that the children of israel would be as the sand of the sea which cannot be measured nor numbered indeed he did not mean for all of us to stay in little Israel, but to populate the entire world so that our numbers could become that plentiful. And so what happened is that a lot of the members of Israel that left Israel were determined to go to a place where they can call their own. And a lot of them came to America. But 
you will never learn that or hear about that in a history book. And the reason for that is Europe feel that they have to disassociate you from the land. Location, location, location. If you knew that you were here hundreds of years before the Europeans, certainly this is more your land than it is the land of the Europeans. Certainly you would want to fight and to die for it. Um, and so this must be hidden. And Europe had to use a number of lies to keep it hidden. Um, one of the biggest lies is that, um, that at that time they thought that the world was flat. That is one of the biggest lies. Columbus in his own mouth, in letters that he wrote to the king and queen of Spain, he said that he had always read that the world is round. And then he listed the authors and the, the, uh, the astronomers and others who wrote that and who taught that. And so all of the learned people of Europe knew that the world was round. Um, and so that is a lie. They did not really believe that you would fall off the face of the earth. Um, they were not trying to get to, as some of them claim, to the Genghis Khan Empire, the Mongols, by heading in that di um, direction. They knew that they were coming to a place the Americas that had neither bars nor gates. They knew that they were coming to unwalled villages and they knew that these people have a lot of gold, but they have no iron, no gunpowder, no means of defending themselves from the nations of Europe that had cannons and swords and had all this heavy artillery and equipment that the Americas did not participate in. And so um, they lied to us and say that they were trying to reach India or that they were trying to reach the Mongolian Empire. Genghis Khan and the Mongols had ravaged much, uh, much of Eastern Europe um, around that time. And so they would not have been looking for Genghis Khan. He probably would have destroyed them. And if they were looking for Indians, why is it that Columbus took two interpreters, an Arabian, an interpreter of, Ar of, um, of Arab, and a Hebrew interpreter? So the, the two people that he expected to find in the Americas, um, well, the languages he expected to, to find in the Americas included um, the Arab languages and it, it included um, Hebrew. And so they were not looking for India. They were not looking for the Mongolian Empire. They knew they were coming to new continents, to new lands, to them anyway. And they knew that um, these people could not defend themselves and that they would be easy pickings. And so this lie that Europe believed that the world is flat is meant to deceive us. It's meant so that we do not understand clearly um, what their intentions were. Another lie um, is that Europe was the first people to bring Africans into North and South America, which doesn't make any sense at all. Um, if you look at the globe or any map, you see that Africa um, is, the, is separated from the Americas by the Atlantic Ocean. And if Columbus got lost while he was trying to go under South Africa and he got blown into the Americas, why wouldn't other ships leaving the western coast of Africa, why wouldn't they be blown into the Americas as well? In fact, what, what Columbus found is many nations of Africa were already living, were already coming to the Americas, some of them having themselves stayed establishing families um, and colonies in the Americas well before the Europeans came. And that trade 
also was very common between the two continents. The difference is that the most of the nations of, of the western coast of Africa that were coming over to the Americas, they were not belligerent nations. They were not warlike nations. Most of them were also children of Israel, and most of them lived in the manner that indigenous peoples all over the world live, and that is in peace and in harmony with their neighbors and with nature. And so when they were coming to the Americas, they did not come to pillage. They did not come to destroy. They did not come to spoil. That did not happen until the arrival of Columbus. Um, now, in the words of Columbus himself, he's, uh, the first place that he landed and brought his man over to was um, the island of IET. And in Columbus's own words, he said that the Mani Congos call IET called the island Sipango. So Columbus said that the Mani Congos, Mani Congo being a nation in Africa at the time, the Mani Congos called the island Sipango. Now it's either that the Mani Congos were the ones that told them about it, because surely Columbus was told about it by one of the nations of Africa, um, probably the Moors, or there was a large settlement of Africans in the island of IET when he got here, so much so that they gave it their own name, Sipango. And the other name that the Indians have for I for the island of IET is Kiskeya. Um, now, Columbus, in his own words, said that he was looking, that he had found a lot of gold. We know that's what he was looking for, gold. And even today, to the elite of Europe, gold is their god gold is what they live for gold is what they die for gold is what they worship now let's look at the words of christopher columbus himself um let's see what he had to say when he spoke about um the island that he called hispaniola the island that is iet This is what Columbus wrote to the king and queen of Spain. Gold is the most precious of all commodities. Columbus lays everything out very clearly. Again, he wrote that gold is the most precious of all commodities. Solomon bought all of it. Gold, precious stones, and silver. But your majesties need only to send to seek them to have them at your pleasure so columbus wrote and he said that solomon had to trade for the gold he had to pay for the gold but all that the king and queen of spain had to do was but send for them why because his intention is to take them by force his intention is to force the native Americans, our fathers, to die in the gold mines for the gold so that he can send it back to, um, to Europe. And he already knew that we had no way of defending ourselves. Um, we could, I continue. David, in his will, left 3,000 quintals of Indian gold to Solomon to assist in building the temple. And according to Josephus, it came from these lands. So Columbus not only found another, a lot of gold, a lot of gold. This is the land of Ophir. The Bible says the gold is good. This is also the land of Havila. Um, Columbus said that um, these are the lands that Solomon got his gold from. Columbus said that the temple that David built, he built, he added that gold to, he used that gold to make the temple pretty. Um, Columbus continues, Jerusalem and Mount Zion are to be rebuilt by the hands of Christians as God has declared by the mouth of his prophet in the 14th Psalm. The Abbe Wakim said that he who should do this was to come 
from Spain. Columbus thought that that was himself. Now, Columbus believed that IET is the site of Mount Zion, that IET is the site of Jerusalem. Let me continue. This is what he had to say about IET. Um, he wrote, Hispaniola, in Hispaniola, there are mountains of very great size and beauty. The rivers surpass anything that would be believed by one who had not seen it. None of them, as I have already said, are possessed of any iron. Neither have they weapons. They are very simple and honest and exceedingly liberal with all they have. None of them refusing anything he may possess when he is asked for it, but on the contrary, inviting us to ask them. They exhibit great love toward all others in preference to themselves. They also give objects of great value for trifles and content themselves with very little or nothing in return. Each of these islands has a great number of canoes. I saw some of these canoes that held as many as 78 rowers. In all these lands, there is no difference of physiognomy, of manners, or of language, but they all clearly understand each other. What Columbus said is that he found a nation of people living in peace. He found that all the islands of the Caribbean were one people. Those people are called the Taino. He said that these people have no iron and no weapons. That's why he felt so comfortable that conquering the Americas would be very, very easy. And he wrote, that these, were tr these people were living the way that our Father wants us to live today. He said, they practice no kind of idolatry, but have a firm belief that all strength and power and indeed all good things are in heaven. These are the words of Columbus. These are the people, our fathers, and our mothers, us, who are living in all of the Americas today, this is what Columbus said um, about us. This is what he is saying about us. And these words about how we were living at the time and also about how densely populated that the Americas um, was at the time, these words were echoed by Bartolome de las Casas, by um, James Adair, by Elias Bodino. All these men wrote what they saw and what they knew to be true at the time. And all of them wrote that there is no doubt in their minds that the nations in the Americas are children of Israel. They wrote that these nations all sing hallelujah and these nations all live in the manner that the Hebrews, that the children of Jacob were living in the Bible, in the ancient days. Um, and he said they even had cities of refuge, just like in the Bible. He said that they were their garments with um, fringes, just like in the Bible. He said that they will not even bow themselves to anybody or any image. They practice no idolatry, just like um, the children of Israel were taught by Moses. And so it became very important to the Europeans to hide all of this from us because they do not want you to fight for the land. They do not want you to know that you were here before they came. Sure, some of our brothers and sisters came along the coastline of Africa, but the numbers are small in comparison to the great majority of us um, who were here before the Europeans came. And now, well, um, we have been mixed, but we are mixed with our brothers. Um, now, you would expect that 
IET and the nation, the people that Columbus met in all of the islands that he was talking about, you would expect that if they are children of Jacob, that you would find some type of evidence in that, in their names, in the names of their cities, in the names of their rivers and of their mountains. And indeed, that is the case. In much the same way um, that the other nations of the world, as their people move from land to land, as they colonize and take over places, they bring with them the names of their cities, the names of, of their rivers, the names of, of their leaders follow them, of their founding fathers follow them into the new place that they are moving into. Um, we see that with the recent movement of the Europeans. You have England in the old world, in Europe, and you have New England in the New World, in the Americas. You have um, York in England. You have New York in the New World, in the Americas. The same way you have Judah and Israel, Ephraim, Joseph and Manasseh in the Old World, in ancient Israel. And as they move across the face of the globe, they would carry the names of their fathers and the names of their leaders and of their father who is in heaven as well and that's what we find in IET that's what we find in the Taino people who are the, the fathers of the people who are in Haiti today and uh, not just in Haiti but also in in Puerto Rico in Cuba in Trinidad in Jamaica we were all one people what happened is that the Europeans went into the islands and now Jamaica speaks English, Haiti speaks Creole and French, and Puerto Rico speaks English and Spanish. It is because the Europeans came and, and split the people, the islands, among themselves. But before they came, we were all one people, and we were called the Taino. Um, and the word Taino itself means good. The reason why Taino means good, um, I don't know, but they certainly behave that way. They, uh, um, and that's why they were known to all the other nations in the Americas, that Taino means good, and they were called the good people. That's because um, the island of Haiti, which was um, the center of the Taino people at the time, that island had a lot of mighty kingdoms, and in each of these kingdoms, the people were taught to live the way that God wanted us to live. And they accepted their neighbors. When somebody came, came from Africa to visit or when somebody came from Europe, like Columbus did to visit, they opened all their doors to Columbus. They took him in, they fed him, they brought him materials to repair his ship. They gave him everything that he wanted, except he turned around and put them into slavery. He handed them over to his European masters who had the same evil intentions that he did. That is to steal the gold and the riches of the land um, and then eventually to take the land itself, which is what they've done in, much, in most of the Americas. And so what we find um, is that when he came to the Americas, he would have been confronted with a lot of things that showed him that these are the people of the book, that these are descendants of Israel. And that's exactly what he found. Now, the word Haiti or IET, if you check it out in a modern dictionary, it's going to say land that is high and mountainous, land of mountains. But that's not the actual meaning of the word IET. They borrow that meaning from the other word that is used for IET, for Haiti. And that name is Kiskeya. Both the name IET and Kiskeya in Columbus's own mouth, um, he said that the natives called the island IET. And Kiskeya is another name that the, that the natives called IET. In the Taino language, if you look at Taino dictionaries, you can have an idea of what Kiskeya means. Now, the word Kis, K-I-S, in Taino means high. The word K 
is used for land, it's used for earth, and it's used for mountains. So kis K means the high land or the high mountains. Now, the Europeans would never tell us this, but Yah means Father. Yah means God. Um, and we learn that in Psalm 68 verse 4, where we learn that Yah means Father. And in verse 5, well, well, verse 5 tells us that Yah means Father. We learn that Yah is the name of the, our Creator in Psalm 68 verse 4. And verse 5 tells us that He means Father. Um, and so Yah is part of the name of IET, as you would expect if IET is indeed a, ch a child of Israel, a child of Judah, uh, as we have come to find out, then you would expect that its name would reflect that. And indeed, the name Kiskeya means in the Taino language, the high lands of Yah, of our Father, of our Creator. Now, the word IET itself, we say Haiti today, but that's an Angler, that's because the word has been anglicized. That's an English way of saying it. They add the H, just like Armageddon and Harmageddon. In English, they add the H sometimes, but the proper word is not IET as they have us write it today, A-Y-I-T-I, it is I-E-T, it is A-H-I-T-I. So the very word I-E-T itself, we find, is a Hebrew word. Um, in Hebrew, words are constructed in parts. Every syllable sometimes is a different component of the word. And if you put all of these parts together, you will have one word and you will know what the word mean by knowing what the parts of the word mean. For example, in ancient Hebrew, Judah, Judah means praise God. The A-H is the part of Judah that stands uh, for God and the praise would come from the Y-U-D or the J-U-D. Well, in I-T, it is constructed, that word is constructed the same way. A for our father, Yah, and E-T, which means with me. I-E-T is a Hebrew word that means God is with me, or our father is with me. But Kiske Yah is not the only Taino word that, uh, that we know of today, that we can relate to today. In fact, if you look at a Taino dictionary, you can relate a lot of Taino words to the Hebrew language and to the language that is spoken by the people of IET today, by the Haitians. Creole is mostly composed of the Taino language. Um, it is not composed by a combination of French and African as, um, as they want us to believe. It is, it is primarily Taino and with an overlay of French. So it is combined primarily with French. It is a combination of French and the original Taino language, which was our language before the arrival of the Europeans. Now, let's look at some words that, um, that are either found in ancient Hebrew, that is in the Taino dictionary, or words that the people of IT use today. Abija is a river in Santo Domingo. Abija is found in the Bible. Abia. A B means father. Ya means father, the creator. A B is father in the general sense. Um, just like um, in the word Abraham, um, Abraham, which was his name before, met father is exalted. The A B met father. Um, and so we see Abia meaning river in Santo Domingo. Another word is Anaki. Anaki, for those of us who look deep into the Bible, we know that um, Anak is one of the high priests and his father was Abba. These were high priests to men like Nimrod, some of the most evil priests that the world has ever seen. Well, the word Anaki is in the Taino dictionary and in Taino it means enemy. Indeed, to Israel, these people were certainly our enemy. 
the Anundi Anaki, the children of Anak. Now, Ana in Taino means flower. Kaona means gold. And so one of the greatest, um, one of the queens that is celebrated much um, for having been one of the queens in the land when Columbus came over, her name is Ana Kawana. And her name means flower of gold. And that's very interesting because Columbus was looking for gold. And that's what he found. That's what he took when he got to, to IET. And one of our leaders was named Anakawana, flower of gold. Now, in Taino, B-A, Ba, means earth or dwelling. It also means father or ancestor. And Baba means father as well. The reason that's, that's important too is because um, in Hebrew, Abba means father, at least in Aramean. That's the language that Jesus spoke when he was here uh, at the time of the Romans. In that part of the world, they spoke Aramean and Abba means father in Aramean. And that's why there's a verse in the Bible that uh, Jesus said, Father, Abba, Baba is the Taino word for father. Um, also notice that Ba means earth and Baba means father. The Tainos, sometimes they would say a word twice to add emphasis or to, to indicate that it was much more of that thing. And Ba becomes Baba for father is an example of that. Another word that is Taino is Balo. That's where we get the English word, word ball and balloon from. A balloon or a ball, that, that word came from the Taino. What that also tells us is that much of the ball games like soccer, uh, basketball, football, a lot of these ball games were games that they found the Indians playing um, when they got here. And then later on, they made it popular and took it over and called it their own. How do we know that? If they were playing ball before that, they would not have a need to borrow that word from the Taino. That's because the Taino were the ones who introduced it to them. Now, this is a word that if you speak Creole, you will know. But to beat or to play. Batai means ball game or match. These are Taino words, but these are words that are used in Haiti today. Bwa is a Taino word. It means house or tree. Bwa. Boyo is also a Taino word that means house or home. Kai is a Taino word, and it's in English too, Cayman. Um, Kai means house or small island. That's where you get the Florida Keys from the word kai another word is ko ko co means fruitful that's a taino word ko ko means very fruitful and we find ko ko coconut is the is what we call the coconut tree a cocoa tree that is we, we got that from the taino now it's interesting that ko means uh fruitful or fertile and cocoa means very fruitful or very fertile. The reason for that is because the coconut tree is a tree that yields its fruit several times a year. You're going to get coconuts every two or three months from one coconut tree. That's why the word cocoa has come to, to mean very fruitful. And if you are a person that speaks Creole, you also know that the word cocoa means something else that has to do with being fertile and with being very fruitful. Um, Daka means I am. Ma means great or water. Ma means great. Mama means mother. It would make sense. So mama is also a Taino word. Um, here's a word that's used in Haiti today. Li. We say, mainly, here he is, or here she is. Li, or 
apostrophe L metal that too is a Taino word you will find that in the Taino dictionary we still use that today Lambi is a Taino word me is another word apostrophe M that we still use today that the, the Tainos were using in the same way um, they used to say Lee and they used to say um, Bal like to give it to him apostrophe L well with the me they used to use it the same way me means I or me or my or mine and not only is me used in Haiti today for example we say Bamwen give it to me but me is also used is also a word that was used in ancient Israel how do we know we can go to the book of Hosea in the first chapter there's a point where God where our father said call his name lo am me it's a construction of a word that has three parts lo am and me the lo means not the am means people and the me means my the me means my the same way in taino the me means mine and so lo am me means not my people and the me in lo am me has the same meaning as it did for the taino people and as it does in haiti today me or apostrophe m um the word maka means tree makak means stick right and makana in taino means wooden club makana makak um ni in taino means it we still use that word in haiti today men me here it is taino we know means um good or noble ni taino means noble man in the taino language opia is also a taino word that is used all over the islands today opia means a uh, spirit in taino kiskeya we spoke about already kiss means high land or high earth and ya means father so kiskeya means high land of the father or high mountain of the father um tekeya means teacher now also it's very important to note that the word ya is also in the taino dictionary and ya means beginning or first cause and the taino used to call our father yaya ya or yaya um and that means the most high and so if ya means beginning or first cause and yaya means the most high in the taino dictionary then kiskeya certainly does mean the high land of our father and there's many many more words that we will find in the taino that has their counterpart in ancient israel or in the people of it today but that's not all if columbus um when columbus got here he knew what he had found he knew that he had found new jerusalem he knew that he had found the branch of judah the place where the new paradise where the new earth and the new heaven was to take place at he knew that it would be in the islands and he knew that it would be in iut but it's not just the the um the words we would also expect that expect to find clues when we look around um haiti and in fact we do see a lot of clues a lot of cities have names that we also find in the bible for example jeremy which is jeremiah um and, and it is jeremy in the french bible um there's a city in haiti named jeremy there's a city in haiti named port of peace who else was called the prince um who else was called prince the messiah he is called the prince and we have a city called the port of the prince the port of the messiah we have a city called port of peace a city called port of salvation 
In addition, we have cities named Benjamin. We have a city named Canaan, also in Haiti. And we have a city named Jerusalem. That's right. We have a city named Jerusalem in Haiti. Um, and if Haiti is indeed a child of Judah, then that is something that you might expect. That's not something that should be unusual at all. Now, what do you think we have next to the city named Jerusalem? There's a mountain that this city is next to. And that mountain in the Creole is called Mon Sinai. Sinai being spelled S-I-N-A-I. Mon means mountain. That mountain is Mount Sinai. We have a mountain in IET named Mount Sinai. Even though there is not a mountain in Israel today named Mount Sinai, there is no mountain that we can go to or find on the map um, that says that this mountain is Mount Sinai. No such label exists. And they have been looking for it for years. Yet in Haiti, we have a mountain named Mount Sinai. And that mountain was not recently named either. It was named Mount Sinai well before the Europeans came in. Um, how do I know? Well, it so happens that I went to Mount Sinai and I spoke to a lot of the natives uh, who live there today. And, I, and some of them are people much older than myself um, and they all assure me that it has been called Mount Sinai for generations from the time that the oldest person um, in the town was very small he knew that it was called Mount Sinai and his parents called it that and their parents called it that and if you google it on google map m-o-r-n-e Sinai you will find Mount Sinai right there in Haiti, um, next to a city called Jerusalem. But that's not all. We also have a fortress in Haiti. In fact, the largest fortress in the Americas. And that fortress is called the Citadel, the same way that David called his, um, that the fortress of David is, is known as the Citadel in IET we have a fortress called the citadel and the fortress is the largest fortress in the western hemisphere the largest fortress in the americas one of the largest in the entire world and as you can see the fortress is built high on top of mountains and haiti is a land of mountains behind mountains and mountains and mountains. Haiti is a very, very beautiful land. Haiti has miles and miles of endless white sanded beaches with beautiful oceans. Um, all of these big beaches lined with coconut trees and palm trees. Haiti is a beautiful land. Columbus knew that and um, there's a lot of the Bible, a lot of the children of Israel in Haiti. And by the way, this fortress, which is called the Citadel in Haiti, down that same mountain that the fortress is built on top of is a town called Milo or Milo. The same way that David had a town named Milo near his city of David near his citadel, the citadel of David's son, the citadel of the branch of Judah, the citadel of IT, also has next to it a town named Milo. And so we see that um, Haiti bears um, a test to being a nation of the tribe of Judah and all of the Americas, both North and South, was heavily peopled by the children of Israel. And the children of Israel, again, is in every nation. We are all colors. We speak all languages. We are now approaching the day that those who the Father has elected 
those will be coming home. And the gathering is unto Judah. Judah is the island, the new Judah of the new world, is the islands of the Caribbean. As you might expect, there's a lot of information in the Bible that talks about the children of Israel being in the Americas, being in a place far away. There's a lot of information that helps us to understand exactly how the children of Israel that are in the Americas, how they fit in with everything that's going to happen in these latter days. Now, um, let's look at Deuteronomy 3, where we learn that, um, that our father said that Israel would be in the land of milk and honey. Well, ever since I was a little boy, I have always known that America is the land of milk and honey. That is, the Americas is the land that flows with milk and honey. Let's read Deuteronomy 3 verse 6. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, talking about the laws and commandments, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Here we see that our father said that the land he was going to give to Israel is a land that flows with milk and honey. Now, remember too, again, that there's no way that our father would have expected us to grow into the billions as we did by scattering all over the world, by us being scattered all over the world. There's no way we would have grown um, into the billions if we had stayed in little Israel. Israel is too small. We would have populated much of the rest of the world. And that's exactly what we did. And in much of the rest of the world, well, most of those lands was virgin. And if you are moving away from densely populated regions to regions that have less people, surely you would also find if the climate is well, you would find good vegetation and you would find plenty of, of, of game and plenty um, good places for you to live. And that's what happened. Um, the children of Israel went and settled in the coast all over the world. And from there, they went inward and they multiplied into the billions. The second book of Esdras also offers us a lot of information about where the children of Israel went when they left um, the kingdoms of Israel and the kingdoms of Judah. Um, the second book of Esdras is not in the Bibles that are circulated in the Americas. They are not in most of your Protestant uh, Bibles anyway. The King James Version of the Bible that we use um, does not have the second book of Esdras because one of the goals of this new religion, Protestantism, that came out of Catholicism, um, was to allow it to mix more easily with the native people of the Americas. Columbus, um, Adair, um, Bartolome de las Casas, a lot of the authors who wrote about the Native Americans wrote that we hated idolatry. We only worshiped the one true God. Because of that, they had to change the religion in a way to mask and, and hide the idolatry that is so obvious in the Catholic religion. They needed to hide it even more. Um, and so they did. And in doing so, they gave us the Protestant religion and they took out from the Bible those books that they um, find to be too dangerous. 
those books that had too much information about who the children of Israel are, at least those who are living in the Americas. Um, and so they gave us a religion and a Bible to match. But if we were to go to the second book of Esdras, um, the 13th chapter, beginning at verse 32, we read, And the time shall be when these things shall come to pass, and the signs shall happen which I showed thee before. And then shall my son be declared, whom thou sawest as a man ascending. This is the father talking. And he is tying this land that is far away that, um, that Ezra is talking about. He is tying it with his son, the Messiah, in verse 35. But he shall stand upon the top of Mount Zion. He's tying it with Mount Zion as well. Verse 39. And whereas thou sawest that he gathered another peaceable multitude unto him, those are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Osea the king, whom Salmanasar the king of Assyria led away captive. And he carried them over the waters and so came they into another land. But they took counsel among themselves. So we just read that um, we just read that the ten tribes appeared as a multitude. And in the book of Esdras, we learn that this multitude is the people that were carried away at the time of Osea, the king of Israel. And when we continue, we see that they took counsel among themselves. They spoke about it. They said that um, we are going to go to a place far away from the heathen, far away from the other empires of the world that refused to allow us to practice the, the laws and the commandments of our father and they knew that Israel was destroyed and later on the people of Judah knew that Judah too was destroyed for the same sin that Israel was destroyed and that is idolatry and that is shedding innocent blood and that is doing all the things that are evil in the eyes of our father that is moving away from his laws and his commandments, which are simple enough. Love and honor your father, your one and only and true king and creator, and treat your fellow man as you will treat yourself. Um, that way you, can, you will be able to live in harmony with our father, in harmony with your fellow man, and in harmony with nature. And so, each time we were forced to be dispersed, those of us that could had that determination to go to the faraway lands of King Solomon and to dare give ourselves a chance to keep the laws and the commandments of God so that we may grow and multiply in the land so that the land will yield good fruits and meat and milk and honey for us and that we in turn will take care of the land take care of each other um, and keep the laws and the commandments of our father and worship the true king of israel the creator of the heaven and the earth and so that was our intention in going to that land and in fact wherever israel israel went all over the face of, of the globe, wherever we went, whenever we had an opportunity where the other kingdoms was not pressuring us and forcing us to do things that, uh, that were out of our control, wherever we went, we tried our best to keep the laws and the commandments of our Father. And that's why we were able to grow into the millions, into the billions, into the sands of the sea and the stars of heaven for sheer number. 
because wherever we went, we tried our best to keep the laws and the commandments of our father. So verse 40, those are the 10 tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Hosea the king, whom Salmanasser, the king of Assyria, led away captive, and he carried them over the waters. And so came they into another land. But they took counsel among themselves that they would leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt, that they might dare keep their statutes which they never kept in their own land. And they entered into Euphrates by the narrow places of the river, for the Most High then showed signs for them, and still the flood till they pass over. For through that country there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half, and the same region is called Osirith. Then dwelt they there until the latter time, and now when they shall begin to come, the highest shall stay the springs of the stream again, that they may go through. Therefore sawest thou the multitude with peace. And so we see that, um, that the children of Israel took counsel among themselves to go to a land where never man dwelt before. They wanted to go to a place where they would not be surrounded by many kingdoms, many mighty kingdoms that would destroy them. And so they went to a place that was scarcely populated. And there they practice um, the commandments, practice keeping the laws and the commandments of our father and there they multiplied into the billions and we know as the father said that he would give us a land of milk and honey he gave us a land of milk and honey and that land of milk and honey is to be found um, all over the americas and all over the coast and in the fat places of the world and he gave us that land um, not for only a short time, but um, we shall have that land in his kingdom because his day, the day of the Lord, is upon us. And as the Messiah taught us, when we pray, we should pray that the kingdom come. The kingdom is coming. And it's time for the children of Israel that is here in the Americas to recognize who they are. And it's time for the children of Israel in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, everywhere in the world to recognize who they are and to be what God intended for us to be. And that is the light of the world so that we can bring the other nations and the nations of the Gentiles into the light with us so that as many people of the children of God may be redeemed as is possible. And so, um, when we learn the truth, everybody gets help. Everybody is better off because as John said in John 4 verse 22, salvation is of the Jews. There can be no doubt that the Taino people are indeed of Jacob, in, indeed the children of Israel. And there can be no doubt that all the populations that Europe found living already in the Americas, North America and South America, those populations was peopled primarily by children of Israel as well. And so it is time for us who are here in America to understand that and to accept who we are, that we are the children of Israel. But what does it mean? Well, if you now know that you are the child of Israel, then you have to behave 
like a child of Israel. You have to read your Bible. You have to obey and accept the laws and the commandments of our Father. And you have to keep your Sabbath to keep it holy. You have to know that there is only one God. And you have to know that our that God is our Father. He is your Creator. And He is the King of Israel. And being that we have a king, our king has not forgotten us. Our king has remembered us. Not because we are righteous, because we are all sinners. He has remembered us because he is merciful, because he wants to save his name. He wants to glorify himself and he shall do that. He shall do that by redeeming us, by buying us from slavery by putting up a ransom for us and then shall he establish his kingdom here on earth forever and we shall live in his kingdom and in that day shall the branch of his planting be in the words of our father glorious in that day holy mount zion will be glorious our father's name and his son and his messiah and his children and all those who wish and who um, have accepted and feared our father all those whom he has elected um, to will enjoy the earth that he had made for us to inhabit we shall enjoy it with him today and forevermore when the kingdom comes